marking statement to the camera and then we'll be off. Fine. Let's see. This afternoon, it's um, November 21st, 2001. We're interviewing Mr. Herbert A. Friedrich. It's, at it's Hubert. 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 I don't. Hubert A. Friedrich at uh, the Culver Road Armory in Rochester, New York. Interviewer is Michael Akey and videographer is Wayne Clark. Uh, Mr. Friedrich, where were you born, sir? In Vienna, Austria. Ah, and you came to this country? Well, I was uh, two and a half years old. I came over with my mother. Mm -hmm. uh, my father couldn't make it because the uh, quota was filled. So we arrived uh, at Ellis Island uh, uh, December 31st. And uh, we couldn't get ashore because, uh, hey, everybody goes home for a holiday. So we slept on the benches there for a couple of days till January 2nd in order to be able to get ashore. Amazing. And uh, where did you end up going? Eventually to Buffalo. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, my mother had a sister there, mm -hmm. and uh, so she had to have a sponsor and work, so she worked at a uh, restaurant there in Buffalo, mm -hmm. because she had done the, the same in, in Vienna. As a matter of fact, the last time we were over there with her, oh, about 15, 18 years ago, we went to the restaurant, it's still there. <laughs> And uh, you grew up in Buffalo? Yeah, yeah. Went to school? Went to school at uh, Riverside High and uh, started working at a place called Phoenix Brewery. I was uh, 18 years old, out of high school, and I did like beer, and I had all the beer I wanted, but, <laughs> but I, I outgrew that. <laughs> you got out, uh, you, you graduated from high school when? In 1939. 39. And, uh, you worked in the brewery for, for about three and a half years, and as an office boy, at uh, four and a half, or five and a half days a week, we got a half day off on Wednesday, and a magnificent sum of twelve dollars a week. Oh, good. Uh oh, but they said, well, if you want to be a good office boy, you got to know something about accounting. So I went to school nights to the University of Buffalo, mm -hmm. and uh, three nights a week for three years. Uh, yeah, it was a pretty dry course, but I thought, well, that's what the boss said I ought to do, so I better do it. <laughs> do you remember where you were when uh, you heard about Pearl Harbor? Yeah. Uh, was with a friend who had an automobile. Wow, that was big stuff. Not only that, but he had a Motorola. Well, that was called, that's an automobile radio. Right. And we were on our way out to Lockport. Why? Well, to go out and get a uh, chocolate milkshake, of course. <laughs> Why else would we go about 35 miles? So on the way out, we listened to the radio, something about attack at Pearl Harbor. And I said, gee, uh, that the, our Navy's out there now. Yeah. Huh? So we got to the, uh, those castles, uh, ice cream parlor or whatever it is. It had a chain, small chain. And we listened to the radio there, and boy, on the way back, we thought, boy, they, they need us. So uh, that was a Sunday. So the next day, uh, we went downtown Buffalo to, to enlist in the Marines. So we get down there, and both of us wear glasses, and the recruiter said, okay, guy, you want to get in? Yeah. And I said, okay, sit down here, and I'll take a couple of tests, take your glasses off. Okay, and I'll read the thing. <laughs> well, fellas, uh, why don't you come back uh, maybe another year or so, or try the Army. <laughs> what a put down. <laughs> so uh, got home that night, and the folks were all upset. And uh, uh, I said, gee, I try to do my best. Well, what's that? Well, I, I think the uh, mother was home. And I said, gee, you try to recruit in the, in the Marines. She said, you did what? And I told her. Oh, I don't know how Dad's going to feel about that. So I told Dad, and oh, he, he was wild. Oh, he was angry. He says, why do you think we came to this country? Well, he says, I was in the war. I was wounded three times you know, in Austria. Mm -hmm. And my, gran my father was in, and my grandfather, and they were all wounded. And I thought, boy, this is the time to get away. Uh, you're young enough. You know, we've got to get out of here and go to America. So... I thought of that one. We were going north out of Metz during the breakthrough. Uh, 
and we're in between a, a bunch of tanks, and I said, here I am, <laughs> here. My father said, well, go to America, so, so you're not going to be at a war. <laughs> sort of ironic. Yes. And um, you joined the uh, enlisted reserve corps? Yeah. That was yeah. your... That's the best I could do, and the, the folks didn't object to that. What was that program like? Well, that was on radio technicians, and I had the faintest idea. I found out what a super heterodyne was, and I could draw sketches and all the other things. Mm -hmm. And that was given at the campus out at the University of Buffalo. It's mm -hmm. way out Main Street at that time. What was the purpose of the Enlisted Reserve Corps? Well, to, to, uh, so I could uh, get some stripes and uh, get some training because uh, what did I know about anything? Right. And uh, somebody said, gee, up at the university you've got a course going and you can enlist. Oh, so I tried that on the folks and uh, said, enlist the Reserve Corps and so on, and you'd go to school and all. Well, they didn't think that was too bad. But I knew at least that that was the only way to get, get around them. Mm -hmm. But you eventually uh, knew that you would be going into the service? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Because we knew we'd probably go to Fort Monmouth eventually, the headquarters for the Signal Corps. Okay. And so the following March, March 14th, uh, we shipped out of Buffalo uh, and by train all the way down to Fort Dix. Mm -hmm. Took the longest time uh, to get down there through, uh, I suppose, Punxsutawney or some other small spots in mm -hmm. Pennsylvania. And we got there, it took almost a day. And they piled us into barracks and the next day, uh, Reveille uh, at 5.30, an uh, ungodly hour. <laughs> and all out and okay, uh, uh, first thing, shot. So we get in there in line and there were two guys on each side, each with needles, and get two shots in this arm, two shots in that arm, and get your clothing and everything. And it was a rude awakening. <laughs> was this your first time away from home? Yeah, yeah, yeah basically, yeah. yeah. So, uh, but I thought, well, this is part of the thing that I've been looking for. And, and uh, with all the clothing and all, uh, yeah, they had a, a sergeant there that uh, was of some renown. Apparently, he was written up in Life magazine at the time. At uh, 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 Sergeant Lewandowski or something like that, and he spoke broken English. He was up on a platform, and all these new recruits that uh, uh, we'd heard don't volunteer for anything. Uh, oh, well, okay. So uh, he said, "Well, all those uh, with uh, with." High school education, uh, raise your hands, okay. All those with college, and, and they said, okay, now you college men, you go, you pick up cigarette butts, you high school, you watch, you other guys, uh, do what you want to do, but they learn from them. <laughs> so, and he pulled that kind of stuff, like, uh, uh, oh, for certain skills to get out of all the detail work and KP and everything. Oh, uh, we look for people who who know shorthand. We 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 uh, we need to shorthand uh, people. Oh, well, a couple of them got up. That uh, okay. We are shorthanding kitchen. <laughs> Carpo took them off for KP. <laughs> well, that was an interesting stop. Uh, and from there down to uh, uh, Camp Edison, down to Seagirt, New Jersey, mm -hmm. and that was. Uh, uh, Thomas Edison's son's place, who was a, a governor at one time in New Jersey, big estate, and uh, that was transferred into a camp uh, with tents and the whole work, so for basic training. Okay. How was that? How'd that go? Well, uh, pretty good. It was uh, cold and windy and wet, uh, and uh, we got some good basic training there. Uh, uh, rifle uh, range out there all over the ocean and that was with uh, Springfields and O1s before they had the M1s mm -hmm. and as a kid uh, I knew how to shoot because uh, dad and his cronies uh, liked to do uh, target shooting at my uh, uncle's place that was out in Darien mm -hmm. and uh, they had a little spot there for their the old German-American war veterans group that got together 
So uh, I would take care of the, uh, uh, the targets. They had built a target thing that ran up and down. So, and then when they went out for their beer, their pinochle, then I had the 22. My dad had a little Remington 22. The whole thing, including stock <laughs> and barrels, only about that long. It took a little short 22s. And so, you know, for years, uh, and now, gee, we get these big rifles with, with uh, uh, all kinds of uh, leather uh, belt on it. Uh, lay down on, on that one, you know, <laughs> it only had, what, 25 or 50 feet, for goodness sake, you know. So, you know, each had maybe 10 shots, and I put 10 in the black, and the instructor said, have you ever shot before? Mm, yeah, but nothing this big. <laughs> All I had were those little jobs. <laughs> so, I got a sharpshooter battle and all that. So, mm -hmm. so but the... Uh, uh, the wind used to howl through there, but then it did start warming up after uh, about a month or so. And uh, we then said, okay, uh, to Fort Monmouth, uh, mm -hmm. so we can do our trade and know something about radio. So we had a uh, full field pack with about uh, 30 pounds and uh, uh, heavy top coats mm -hmm. and the boots and everything, and we walked from there. We didn't march, we walked <laughs> uh, to Fort Monmouth. That's probably about 25 miles, left, let's say. So it was wet and, and rainy. And uh, when we ever got a break, then we, we'd find a pile of rock or something near the roadway because that was dry. <laughs> didn't want to sit on the ground. So uh, finally got to uh, Fort Monmouth and started in radio school. You know. So. Uh, there were only a, a few months, well, well, occasionally we'd get a, get away for uh, a weekend. So we'd go into a Little Silver and catch the train, the New Jersey Central, into New York. Oh, that was big stuff. Oh. <laughs> oh. It was pretty different for a country boy. Well, yeah, yeah, that was something. So, uh, and one day, uh, one of the fellows that brought his uh, motorcycle in from Schenectady, I believe, so he and I went to New York on a motorcycle. Well, that was great coming through the uh, the Lincoln Tunnel, I believe, or Hudson, whatever, <laughs> and up Broadway. And boy, that was big stuff. <laughs> so we, uh, we all of a sudden a call came in that they were starting a thing called ASTP, Army Specialized Training Program. And that's for engineering and language people. So they looked through the records and they said, well, hey, uh, we can use you. Well, I, well you speak you know, read and write German. Yeah, yeah. Well, come on along. So a bunch of us uh, went to different colleges, and I ended up at CCNY, mm. City College of New York at 138th in Amsterdam, and spent half a year there. And we were in uniform, and uh, we'd march to class. Uh, across the street there was an old uh, Jewish orphanage that had been abandoned, that was redone for uh, barracks. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we lived there, and then in the uh, CCNY, we took uh, uh, oh, about six to seven hours of courses every day. It would be German, uh, not only language, but history, uh, the military, uh, the social problems, the economy, et cetera, et cetera. So we got a pretty good uh, background that way. And it was great, uh, what a change from a camp <laughs> to that, though. So. And we were all in pretty good shape because we felt sorry for the old guys that had to go through all this, the work and everything, the guys that are in their 30s. Uh, <laughs> it must have been tough on them. So we walked uh, down to Times Square, 137th Street. Well, as you may know, that there are 20 blocks to a mile. And it's so exact that that's how they... Uh, Check the cab meters. Drive within mm -hmm. 20, mi uh, 20 blocks. That's one mile. So we can see the mileage from 137th Street down to 42nd Street. So we we uh, hit a few refreshment places on the way down, and and we had good walking shoes. Man, that didn't bother us. What a few miles. But on the way back, we sure took a subway. And I, <laughs> oh, well, that was a interesting time. They. Uh, they even uh, wanted to get us to do more exercise where they had a gym and a pool there. 
but the uh, officer in charge, his name was Wiener, Irving Wiener, I remember. And uh, the first time he addressed us, a lot of us didn't think much of him when he said, well, okay, you guys, you got to get your hair cut. You got to get them short so you have them long. And there we go, oh, and he didn't know what we were laughing about. <laughs> so anyway, he decided that we needed to really get out there and do a thing that Army people should. So he decreed that we go for a hike. Well, from there up to the George Washington Bridge, a pretty good haul up the 190th, over the George Washington Bridge, down the Jersey side to 125th Street Ferry that used to run mm -hmm. across there. Back on 25th Street, back to 137, walk all the way. Of course, the uh, the second lieutenants on up, they, uh, that was beneath them, and they were, were in jeeps. And you can imagine, uh, I could just see Malden <laughs> with a cartoon of that. Needless to say, uh, with a gang like that, we, uh, I think that company strength was uh, maybe 200, 220 guys. Well, uh, nature being what it is, uh, we had to relieve ourselves. Uh, the best way to do it was when nobody was around and a whole bunch of us on the George Washington Bridge. So there we were, <laughs> the whole gang. And of course, we were on the leeward side, fortunately, and on the south side of the bridge. And we all stood there and enjoyed it with the cars going by up above there. And it didn't bother us. Uh, rather interesting stay. So do you want me to keep on going? Uh, okay. And, uh, after that, uh, uh, they start breaking that up, and the engineer fellows went to different camps around the country. The language guys, uh, most of us ended up at Camp Ritchie in Maryland, mm -hmm. right at the Pennsylvania border. That's just uh, south in the Catoctin Mountains where FDR had a Shangri-La. Now, were most of the language guys first generation? Uh, a number of them, yeah. Okay. yeah. And others had to learn it at school. Okay. And uh, so was quite a number of them there were foreign born. Or, but they also had French students and Russian students too. Oh. But then we were in the German section of it. And they had small classrooms. Uh, so we got to know uh, so the G, uh, uh, military intelligence service camp. So we got to know more about the German army than I knew about my own army. <laughs> yeah, we'd have to know uh, uh, the units, uh, their formation, uh, uh, what they consisted of as far as supplies, armament, uh, who the commanding officers were, uh, the replacement depots, the insignias of the uh, division or the regiments, mm -hmm. besides the insignias and and adornments of the officers and so on. Uh, and there were several different kinds of uh, groups that were broken down into uh, uh, PI, which was photo interpretation, where you take photo, aerial photos and uh, with stereoscopic lens, mm -hmm. so you get some depth. And uh, just by simple arithmetic, uh, figure out, say, how long a bridge would be. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the relationship of the altitude of the plane and the focal length of the camera, and the image on the on the uh, photograph, one is to one is one is to the other. We knew that the let's say uh, one inch on here is equals to 200 feet. Mm -hmm. So we got to know sizes that way. As far as heights were concerned, uh, we'd tell that by uh, the shadows, the length of the shadows, knowing uh, the altitude of the plane and focal length. Uh, but more important, the time of day and time of year. Mm -hmm. So you could say, well, gee, here's a building that's 100 feet high or whatever. <coughs> also, I had terrain intelligence where you had to be map makers, so they took us out in, into the mountain areas and drew uh, contour maps. Uh, and there's the IPW's interrogation of prisoners of war. And uh, we had a stint at that so that you'd know how to interrogate because that was a great source of information with the PWs. Mm -hmm. So we could identify who's out there and what strength, mm -hmm. and what are the movements, uh, so on and so forth. And the other one that I finally ended up in was an OB team, an order of battle team. Order of battle to uh, 
we would keep the situation map for the G2, which at Corps headquarters where we ended up was a colonel, a bird colonel. We'd keep the situation map, and we would also interrogate prisoners, but get information from the IPW team, from the PI team on the uh, photographs, and also talking to civilians. So that uh, we would change the map as as we want well, with the, uh, the plastic overlays uh -huh. uh, to indicate the, the German positions and the, uh, the reserves and so on. So we, uh, we got that done yeah, pretty well and we ended up as a, a three-man team. I was low on the totem pole as a staff sergeant uh, because we were the most recent graduating class. The class before us all got master sergeant, <laughs> a lot of stripes. And one before that got second lieutenant, so uh, sort of arbitrary, but uh, so be it. So the three of us worked as a team, and eventually were issued a, a, a jeep and a trailer, and the trailer had uh, uh, records and everything, so we could keep that uh, reference books on the German army, and uh, also with the uh, uh, magnesium grenades, so that in case. Uh, we're going to be captured, we can pull the pin and all the records we had would be destroyed. So, so we, uh, we finally shipped out out of Boston and uh, aboard ship, uh, a whole bunch of us, uh, they, they said, well, it's a zebra group, everybody with stripes. <laughs> so we had to, uh, it took about six to seven days over to, from Boston to Liverpool. And we had a couple of submarine alerts, but we were on our own because it was a fast ship. I forgot the the name of the steamer, but or it was a, well, a canard line, I think. It was pretty fast, so being a speedy ship, you did need a, an escort. Ha. Well, when you're down in the bowels of the ship you, and you hear that thing clanging away, <laughs> you have second thoughts. Mm -hmm. But uh, what a beautiful sight to see uh, the northern part of Ireland. It's so green and verdant into Liverpool, then down to London, uh, to our headquarters there for another month's worth of uh, indoctrination mm -hmm. to get up to speed as to what was on the uh, Normandy coast and uh, the northern France uh, especially, so that so we could then focus pretty much on those. So this was uh, when, 1944? Four, yeah. So I uh, uh, did get to uh, France to Omaha Beach until, oh, about uh, five weeks after, the end of July, mm -hmm. mid-July. And we uh, uh, came ashore at Utah Beach. We came down the uh, uh, the, the rope ladders. Well, they, they weren't ladders, really. They were uh, cargo nets. Mm -hmm. And we were we were told now to use a cargo net. You don't go down, hang on like this. You hang on to the vertical one because those are stable. The other ones, you may fall in. And it was a pretty good drop from the side of the ship down into the landing craft. So, but our, our second lieutenant, he was a, uh, another kind of person, and he would never share any of his liquor rations, ever. Well, the son of a gun uh, uh, carried in his val pack. Well, being the low man on the totem pole, I was asked to, he told me i got to carry the thing down into the landing craft. Well, I was still about 15 or 20 feet up, and I know he, how he packed it and all. And, oh, it slipped, bottom and went, and it broke his bottle down there. Oh, gee, Lieutenant, I'm so sorry. <laughs> and, oh, well, he chewed me out, and I, I'll fix him. <laughs> well, so never, never screw around with an enlisted man. <laughs> they have ways. Yeah, yeah. So, so who were you assigned to? Uh, we were just an advanced group for the military intelligence service to set up shop in Paris as soon as we, whenever we got there, mm -hmm. and we had no assignment yet. So we came ashore in Boulogne and uh, spent some time there and picking up and, and getting used to it and doing some work for the local G, G2. Mm -hmm. And then finally broke out at the Falle Gap area. Did you get through that area? Yeah, around St. Lowe. St. Lowe held out for a long time. Cherbourg was still still occupied. They couldn't get the Germans out of there. What were your uh, thoughts about going through the gap? Oh, uh, not too bad. It just uh, we got to get to Paris, <laughs> whatever. Mm -hmm. So uh, 
Yeah, we swung south of uh, St. Lo, and then back in, uh, and we got into uh, Paris, uh, August, uh, oh God, time goes by, 22nd, 23rd, somewhere in there, about the, the week of the liberation. Mm -hmm. And as we got into the outskirts, we were told to stand aside because de Gaulle and his group on the march down the Champs Elysees. So, well, so be it. <laughs> so I guess he got the big welcome and all. Mm -hmm. So we got into Paris and uh, uh, found a nice spot there off the Champs Elysees on Rue Washington. It was a little hotel, and oh, what a nice deal! <laughs> And concierge had a nice daughter, but he was watching her like a hawk. <laughs> so, and then they had a separate setup for the headquarters. And uh, the first uh, two, two and a half weeks were pretty bad because no electricity. The Germans had uh, blown up a lot of the stuff. And without electricity and power, no water. Mm -hmm. So the sewage couldn't be flushed. And the smell was something else. Like I think I mentioned in one of my things that yes. the that the the perfume of the, that the girls wore it, it did override that. Mm. So they thought before uh, they were able to sign us to do something with us, they sent us out to a, a, a mansion on Avenue Foch, one that goes off the Etoile there, off the uh, Arc of Triumph, and uh, to process German documents. That was at SS headquarters which eventually turned out that it was the anti-Semitic group of the SS. Hmm. So uh, we went through it and there was all stuff on uh, the Jewish people and the problem. Well, the master sergeant with our group, his name was Sheldon, assumed name. Uh, he was a, a German dentist, Jewish dentist in Berlin and got out in time. So, and he knew French, and could read French and all. So he said, oh boy, look at all these. And, and uh, I found a, uh, a stack of documents with uh, uh, drawings on them, uh, pencil drawings, the thatch huts and all. And I said, hey, what's this? It looks like a, a, a tropical area. And uh, the other sergeant looked at it. He said, oh, my God, that's Colonel Dreyfus's drawings. I said, well, who's Colonel Dreyfus? Well, hey, at 23, what do I know about those things? He said, oh, these are really something. That while he was at Devil's Island, on trumped up charges that he made these sketches. Say, so oh boy, if they're that valuable, let me send them home and we could get some money from a historical society. He, he said, these belong to the French people. Well, he was right, really. So what he did with them, I don't know, but uh, they're floating around somewhere. Uh, I asked him what other docents at the Louvre, whether if they'd ever seen anything mm -hmm. like that, and so they didn't know, but mm. it was rather interesting. So we, we stayed right at the uh, mansion, and uh, it was the latter part of August, early September, comfortable. And so he said, did you find anything else? I went through a sub-basement, and I said, well, nothing down there. Just a bunch of uh, champagne, empty champagne bottles. He said, yeah, how many? I said, oh, maybe a couple of hundred. He said, oh, that's great. I said, what, what do you mean that's great? He said, hey, well, the French people have a lot of wine, but they have no bottles. Let's see what we can do. So we loaded them into the trailer and went shopping. We ended up, uh, I think, four or five uh, empties for one bottle full of champagne. So that was a pretty good deal, but but no good for brushing teeth. It just doesn't do the job. He was a pretty enterprising fellow. Well, <laughs> so that was, yeah, well, that was great. We got to see... Uh, uh, we did get to the Louvre, and by that time they'd open it up, and we could mm -hmm. see the Mona Lisa. No, I don't think the Mona Lisa was back at the Wing Victory of Samothrace, so the big statue was there. And uh, so we did our thing. Uh, and some of the flyboys, of course, they flew it under the, through the arches of the Eiffel Tower. That that's not much clearance there. Oh, what what, 150, 200 feet maybe, but <laughs> with, with fighter planes on. Come on, but they they had a ball flying through the arches. So we got to know Paris pretty well. And after about a month to, to five weeks. <coughs> and then the call came in that there was a new outfit coming in stateside. Cherbourg finally collapsed and they opened up. And we needed that for deep water ports. Uh, and the Third Corps was coming in.
which would join Third Army. And so they said, okay, you're assigned there. So after the plush life of Paris, through all the mud there in the end of September uh, or uh, beginning of October, all the way back to Normandy. And of course the roads were all chewed up. The mm -hmm. tank, tank treads really do a job on a turn all the way back there. And so we uh, got back there with cold and wet. And uh, so we were trying to get organized. And we found a couple of empty houses. And there was one guy there that he said, oh, I'll build a fire. And I said, okay. So uh, I said, oh, when's the fire? He said, oh, just a minute. So, and as we walked in, he had a jerry can. It's the five-gallon can that we had on the back of a Jeep. I drove that crazy thing from Normandy all, all the way to, to Munich. Uh, one of them, anyway. So, uh, what are you doing? So he had a jerry can, putting gas on, on, the, on the logs and some paper. I said, you can't do that. I, he put the cap on. I said, why not? I said, that thing will blow up. He said, oh, what are you doing? So, boom. <laughs> we got the hell out of there. <laughs> crazy. Uh, guy, <laughs> I have to use good language. I, I so <laughs> crazy. Well, uh, we had words for him. I, I burned the damn house down. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. So, well, it, yeah, it was just whoop, like that yeah. because of the uh, the gas, uh, the uh, vapors, mm -hmm. vapor. You know. oh, so we, they said, okay, now they're going to move forward. They're going to pick up. Uh, organization, but nothing through Paris. Well, why not? Well, they lose too many guys. <laughs> well, speaking of losing guys, when we first got there, uh, there's still a few snipers, but they, they got out in time and the general who was in charge didn't blow everything up, so like he was supposed to, I guess. But uh, a lot of German troops left behind. Really? And you could tell who they were from their haircut, and their and their uh, young age, oh. and every once in a while, you, uh, then we we had MPs with us around and mm -hmm. round them up, and uh, every once in a while I get up behind a guy and I wasn't too sure, and so I'd go, "Still your standard spinning, uh, touch it," yeah. and he go like that, <laughs> we, <laughs> and we had him. <laughs> so and, and they didn't care anymore. Mm -hmm. For them, the war was over. So but, did you get to interrogate these fellows? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they said, well, hey, enough is enough. Especially the ones that were a little older, meaning in the late 20s, compared to the, uh, the, the younger ones, they were still pretty porky. Mm -hmm. But uh, a lot of the girls that uh, they shacked up with uh, 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 kept them hidden pretty well, but they had to get out once in a while. Mm -hmm. so. so at this point, you're part of the, um, the Third Army? Uh, th third Corps, Third Army, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we were part of uh, Third Corps headquarters, uh, the Order of Battle Team, uh, to keep the situation mapped. So we moved pretty quickly, but uh, we we said gee, we had to go through through Paris to pick up stuff at our headquarters. Yeah, that was a pretty good excuse, and we spent a little more time there. Mm -hmm. And we caught up with them up down up through Verdun. And as we're going through Verdun, uh, we saw the big uh, uh, burial area there, mm -hmm. and I thought. Well, never learned. Did your father been through that area? Uh, no, he was on the Eastern Front. Uh, down the, with a Russian. <laughs> yeah, he, uh, matter of fact, he still had the horse blanket. He was a uh, cavalry, or like many of them. And he brought the horse blanket with him to this country. It still had the, the scars or the uh, scars in it where the horse was... Uh, Killed from under with a saber thrust mm -hmm. right through the horse blanket. <laughs> uh, so when, um, so this is what around September, October. 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 Oh, October into into early November. Now, what were your uh, what were your order of battle maps showing at that point? Okay, at that point, uh, when we got to uh, well, things were moving so fast right. uh, after Paris. Uh, and we ended up uh, just outside of Metz, and that took a, quite a while to get through because they had two uh, built-in fortresses on hilltops, and uh, which commanded the uh, intersections. So with their heavy guns and all, that was a problem. 
forgot the name of the other one. One was Fort Driant. That was the last one to give out. And uh, so we finally opened those up, and, uh, and the stench of human flesh was, yeah, something I remember. Because that, that night, I think, for, for Chow, we had, uh, oh, some sort of, not a stew, but the ground meat with stuff in it, and, uh, and I haven't liked it since. <laughs> but at that stage, we are keeping the, the map uh, up to date, and we were moving toward the Sar region. And uh, about the middle of November, we, on our map on our left flank, uh, flanking uh, with the First Army, they were just to the north of us, at uh, uh, Hufalis, an area similar to uh, oh, what the Adirondacks would be. Mm -hmm. At uh, a couple of divisions showed up, and then a couple more. And it wasn't the numbers by themselves, but the quality. They had, I uh, can't remember all the details, 5th Paratroop Division, a crack division. And some of them that uh, uh, had not been spotted in a long time from the Russian front or the Italian front showed up. What was the, sen what was the core sense at that point of uh, German capabilities? Uh, indicating that there's something over there, the, the, uh, uh, the evaluation was that there is a nest of troops there. We don't know why they're there, uh, but we kept reporting. Uh, we had a daily report that went back to Shafe, Supreme Headquarters, uh, Allied Expeditionary Force, back in Paris. And weekly, we get uh, a summary back. And for a couple of weeks, you know, we kept reporting that. And we could see what the First Army was reporting, the same thing. And we got the summary back. You could see the buildup. Uh, you're, you're getting to fancy groups like the Hermann Panzer Grenadier Division. What the hell are they doing there? And uh, before you know it, uh, it must have been, oh, eight, ten big divisions. In a place like uh, Plattsburgh, let's say, in comparison, what are they doing there? So to me and to the others that were there, this is no surprise, I think. Uh, they ought to dig out the archives out of Washington to find out, you know, what the response was and what the evaluation was back at headquarters, mm -hmm. saying, well, they'll just take a chance that if they try to get through, they're going to have a tough time or whatever. I, I didn't know. Excuse me just a second. Yeah. We're going to change things. Oh, okay. Uh, the Germans have been chased. The, the, the Third Army... So advance had been so fast, the feeling was that would be uh, no, 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 no problem. Right. Well, uh, no, uh, I couldn't say that. I don't know what they were thinking. Okay. But, but what uh, were you thinking? Well, we were thinking, well, what the hell are all these troops doing there? They're not there just for a rest stop, especially with these crack divisions mm -hmm. and a couple of puncher divisions that are, uh, we, gee, there's, there's, there's something wrong somewhere. But I thought, well, the powers that be, uh, we're just small minions of, <laughs> of the brass. Uh, that's why uh, with the Freedom of uh, Information Act, I think somebody should really dig into the archives in Washington. Now, and find out. was uh, your sense of uh, unease shared at Corps headquarters? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I said, well, it's, uh, this doesn't look right. Well, uh, but then... Being a staff sergeant, I wasn't privy to what the, uh, well, Patton was in the same uh, uh, building there. We were in uh, the city hall in Metz. You didn't see him much? <laughs> oh, from time to time. Uh, one time, he even spoke to me. Uh, I was on my way in, and he's coming out of the building, and there was a plane going by, a fighter plane. He looked up, and he said, Sergeant, is that one of ours? And I had two words for him. I said, yes, sir. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> what, was your, what was the feeling about Patton? Uh, good, good. That, uh, that he's going to kick ass no matter what. And, uh, and under his direction, by God, we're going to do something about it and get this thing over so we can go home. How did you feel about his sense of spit and polish? Uh, well, it was sort of unusual, but uh, uh, with his shiny helmet and, uh, and his pearl-handered... Uh, uh, revolvers on his side and his Ike jacket. Uh, uh, 
other than that, you know, just uh, that he was a character, I think, is uh, my best explanation. Well, you had to stay pretty uh, cleaned up. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We had to shave every day. Oh, yeah. But that was a little unusual for a lot of, um, for other corps. Oh, yeah. But uh, we just took it for granted. Uh, and shaving with cold water, you get used to it after a while. <laughs> uh, so we, uh, but uh, but then we uh, thought, well, okay, Christmas is coming up soon, and I had that picture taken. Mm -hmm. I put the date on there. It was mid-December, and the next day, all hell broke loose, the 16th. And everybody, uh, got to get out in 30 minutes. What, what the hell's going on? Big breakthrough up north. Oh, what the hell? Where, where are we going? Well, up to the Belgian Luxembourg border, uh, to Luxembourg City and Arlon, uh, mm -hmm. up that way. So we packed everything up and uh, we headed north. And uh, it's like from here to uh, almost to Buffalo. And when you think of it, that's not that far away. <laughs> but anyway, that's where Bastogne was. Well, we had to stop short of Bastogne. So we moved uh, in our fourth armored, uh, spearheaded up, up through there. Oh, the uh, uh, when they went went through the uh, uh, villages and all that, uh, they just tore up everything. It was very muddy mm -hmm. and it was snowy, snowing like mad. And uh, so it took us uh, uh, a couple of days just to get up near the border. Mm -hmm. And we got up to a place called Arlano. It's just at the southern. Uh, tip uh, or the confluence of Belgium and Luxembourg, uh, and we put up in a slate mine there for headquarters for a while. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the uh, things were going hot and heavy. And uh, as we started moving further north, another little town report came back. Okay, the Germans are coming down the road with their you know, tanks and all, uh, and they're oh, about ten miles away. So the colonel said, well, you better or, uh, issue rifles to the cooks and all. And a couple of the cooks said, Dude, we don't know anything about this. They said, hey, you got basic training. Yeah, well, we didn't do anything. So I had to teach them how to load the clip and everything into the rifles and all. So we were, we were ready. But uh, uh, luckily, they, uh, uh, they got stopped, or 4th Armored stopped them. Were you getting uh, intelligence? Constantly during this? No, not too much. Not when they're on the move that much. Oh, it was just a, a survival thing at okay. that point. Oh. So, uh, well, we know they're there and uh, this is it. Uh, we, we don't have any time uh, or movement available to us to, to evaluate things. Mm -hmm. But as soon as we settled down for a couple of days and uh, we got uh, information from the uh, 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 people that lived in the areas, because they're the best ones, because they're refugees are fleeing, mm -hmm. and tell us what's happening and where they are and so on. And with a few prisoners uh, being taken, and that's where they got a bunch of guys dressed in GIE outfits that were speaking uh, English or mm -hmm. American that were German. So I, I didn't get to uh, interrogate any of them. They, they were. Uh, I think with part of the first army, because third and first army sort of came together there, mm -hmm. and the uh, 101st Airborne were the ones that got stuck in, in Bastogne. Mm -hmm. So, so we, uh, so Christmas came. We, you know, somebody chopped down a little fir tree about that big, and then we used uh, uh, the uh, tin foil out of the cigarettes for ornaments, and so we had our Christmas. Oh. Who was your commanding officer? Uh, the Colonel Horner. He was from Texas somewhere. Mm -hmm. Now remember that name because as we got into Germany, we used his name to sign for kegs of beer. Uh, when they said, well, who's going to pay for it? Well, Colonel Horner put his name down. <laughs> Good guy? Yeah, 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 yeah. And then another guy was a lieutenant colonel. He was a West Pointer. We, he was just a little too... Uh, uh, Starchy. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he did. Uh, he lived a different life than uh, most of us civilians in the uniform. Mm -hmm. No, 
uh, speaking of uh, of uh, breweries and all the uh, jumping ahead a little bit in the middle of Germany there we uh, were in a little village and uh, one of the officers uh, where are the cooks there are the three three cooks there's nobody around sergeant go find them oh yes sir where the hell am I going to look for them so I start walking down and I see people going down the, the road with uh, uh, with pitchers and with buckets and pans and all. I said, who can see him? Yeah, where are you going? Oh, to the brewery, to, to the brewery. Hmm, be so, how, how come? Oh, it's keep fry beer, yeah, it's free beer. Oh, oh, so I, I, so I said, okay, I'll come along. <laughs> and sure enough, there are the three guys are in there. South to the ears, they got a hose uh, in a small town brewery and they're <laughs> passing out beer to everybody, come on. So we shut off the valve. Okay, come on, let's go. <laughs> the colonel wants you. Uh, but that was a little aside. Mm -hmm. That's fun. Uh, so, but a after Bastogne was taken, then we uh, were switched to First Army. So then we swung up north and took a side trip to uh, Liège and, and too far for Brussels to pick up some more information to get the first army stuff together and we start moving westward and uh, it did swing as far as Cologne although I did get up to Cologne because of the PW camp up there that we had to, uh, interrogating to do and uh, the, uh, saw the towers of the uh, Cologne uh, Cathedral which had been damaged mm -hmm. uh, but as we were swinging south we went near a, a spa called Bad, Bad meaning a bath, Bad Neuenauer. And then the MPs couldn't pronounce that, so they Bad Noon Hour. And uh, that was about, uh, oh, six miles, five, six miles from a railroad bridge at Remagen. And the word came back that the railroad bridge was intact. So the forward group said, what do we do? And they, Commanding officer said, well, cross, uh, cross it, get over. And uh, somebody else said, well, gee, Montgomery was supposed to uh, have done that up north. He was wanted to be the first one to cross the Rhine. And they had some very uh, deprecating remarks about General Montgomery. <laughs> so the order to go, you know. And uh, it was a railroad bridge, but between the tracks they had these big ties, so it was uh, like a wood road. So the railroad could still run, mm -hmm. but trucks and, and, uh, and uh, pedestrians could walk. Mm -hmm. Pretty wide there, so I would say about a mile across. So uh, we crossed it with our Jeep and get on the other side and uh, pick up some stuff and, uh, on the way back. And, and the engineers were starting to work on it because we'd gotten documents indicating that the bridge mm -hmm. was supposed to have been blown already. Apparently some of the explosives had gone off and had weakened the bridge, so the engineers were on there to try to uh, reinforce it. But meanwhile, the uh, Navy or like the Seabees came along with pontoon bridges and they came with these huge trucks with these big pontoons you know, so they could have trucks and tanks crossing. And the first vehicle there, the officers stepped out in the shiny black shoes and stepped in about that much mud. And he pulled back, and oh my God, look at the mud. And I said, welcome to the war, Navy. <laughs> I guess he didn't like that remark. So, uh, uh, did, so you we, do much, me, did you do much uh, interviewing of prisoners? Uh, not too often. What was it, how did that typically go? Well, it, uh, say, well, first of all, you give them a cigarette, relax them, you know, take it easy, and where's your hometown, and if you have any relatives, and so on. And, where are they living and are they all right? And and I said, well, I've got a sister at home. Listen them too. And, and the, your outfit was the one. Oh well, yeah. I said, well, the older fellows would at that time they didn't care anymore. So they tell the unit who they're from and all and, and where they came from and so on. And the biggest giveaway was the sold book, which is a little book about uh, oh five by eight. Had their picture in it, their ID, 
and uh, their rations when they were issued in their uh, hometown, uh, the unit they were with, and so on. So that in itself was a, a big plus. Mm -hmm. you know, because the, their units never changed much. Uh, their insignias and the markings always stayed the same. They, they weren't as mobile mm -hmm. uh, as we were. The younger guys tend to be a little... Yeah, they, they were porky, yeah. So, but then uh, when they didn't have any food or water, they they relented a little bit. So, uh, Did you ever interview any SS or...? Uh, oh yeah, oh yeah, they were pretty porky too. That's the Schutzstaffel <laughs> SS. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they, uh, they were... Uh, uh, didn't do much with them. They, uh, they right, right to the core. So, because they normally didn't have any older guys in, it, mm -hmm. but the other groups did. Yeah. Was your uh, intelligence gathering usually fairly good, fairly efficient? Yeah, fairly, fairly reliable, uh, and we'd, we'd process documents too. Uh, oh, on the bridge, uh, uh, it was on March 17th. I remember it was St. Patrick's Day. The bridge collapsed. We lost about 18 engineers on the thing. Meanwhile, the pontoon bridges have been put up. Well, we uh, we crossed that a number of times, and one of the times we were on the other side, we picked up some documents, and it uh, a document was from uh, well, picked up from one of the troops that sent back to us, uh, one of our guys, and uh, it was a document uh, showing that the major in charge of blowing the bridge was court-martialed, and for dereliction of duty because it didn't collapse, was shot. So we thought, oh, this is sort of interesting, so we sent it back. Uh, back a few years ago, on my 50th anniversary type of thing, we went there and we went to Remagen. And the, the big uh, towers on the end, the bridge was never rebuilt, big towers on the end were a museum. Mm. So I asked the docent there, I said, I said, how long has this been there? And so I said, well, you know, I was here way back when. And I said, it was supposed to have been blown up at the time, uh, but we crossed anyway, and that we'd gotten a, uh, a document uh, showing the court martial of this major, German major, and that he was shot. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So she, oh, Mr. Bowen, went over to a glass covered case and pointed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what it was. So, and I asked him, I said, well, gee, how come the bridge was never rebuilt? He said, well, it was built during World War I for military purposes, uh, for troop trains. That's about the only way they could move uh, any distance. And it was used again uh, during this war, uh, again. And it turned out for economics it wasn't worth it. Hmm. So they never rebuilt it. But the towers on either end? Yeah, they're still, still there. And on the far end, very, very steep uh, cliffs and a railroad tunnel that went right through there. Oh, uh, crossing over on the pontoon bridge uh, one day, this, uh, the other sergeant and myself, and we're going along and all of a sudden, choo -choo 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 -choo, uh, bullets flying around in the wall. What the hell is that? We didn't hear, hear anything. And we shoot, what the hell was that? Uh, meanwhile, we did, everybody ahead of us, they gunned it too to get off that damn bridge. And it turned out that uh, I said, oh, that must be one of those new rocket planes. Well, what the hell is that? Well, coming from Buffalo, my, one of my best friend's father worked for Bell Aircraft, and they had they called a rocket plane at mm -hmm. that time, which turned out to be the jet. It was a Messerschmitt uh, 262. 252 or something. And by God, yeah, they're coming down there. And uh, gee, the next day, they're back again. So we didn't go back over the bridge, needless to say. Uh, and they had our fighter planes, the uh, P-51, the uh, double-tailed job. It looked like we were standing still. Well, the difference in speed, I think, was something like 100 miles an hour. What, that's a big difference. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't do anything with them. And uh, so they kept coming in. And all of a sudden, over on the far side of the bridge, uh, bumper to bumper, he had these half-tracks with the... Uh, 50 caliber anti-aircraft machine gun. There are dozens and dozens of them on both sides of the, the bridge area. There was a road right along the Rhine there on the on the eastern shore. 
And uh, later we found out that the colonel, uh, the artillery colonel, was raising hell. What the hell? They shot a couple hundred thousand rounds of ammunition, never brought anything down. Well, they heard the shooting was good, so they came from all over, uh, all over the, the, the front, <laughs> you know, from a couple hundred miles away because they heard the shooting was good down there. Because up to that time, they didn't have anything to shoot at. <laughs> uh, uh, Oh, speaking of uh, regressing back to uh, around Christmas time, we were in a place called uh, Martelange, which is also known as Martelingen, and we were in a schoolroom. Those are good places to, to live during the winter time too. And uh, the the skies open up, so there's aircraft was coming in strafing. We weren't sure whether it was ours or theirs, but we took cover and and glass all over the place. Well, luckily we were in a, a lab kind of room, the heavy lab tables with big thick covers, and we got under those. And so all we got was just shards of glass that cut the guys a little bit, but not, not too bad. But uh, so the extent of the air cover wasn't too good because of the the, uh, the uh, skies were socked in pretty much with clouds. Now you mentioned Montgomery earlier. What uh what was your general opinion of him? Oh, very low. <clears throat> For one thing, as we were coming in through Normandy, he was—he had promised, I guess, to take uh, Caen by a certain date, and uh, and he wasn't anywhere near it. And we had to take uh, troops. I know the third. I had to move troops from the south up there to take Caen. So, so uh, as far as anybody was concerned, he was a lot of words and bluster, and and uh, the classic. British officer who probably stopped for tea at 10 and at 2, <laughs> but uh, very low. Now, uh, in the First Army, did you deal with many British troops? Uh, no, because they were further north. Uh, we were at the southern part of the First Army, but after we got through Riemagen, uh we got spun off again back to Third Army, and we headed south. and. Uh, we stopped at a, what looked like a big PW camp just outside of Munich. Yeah, the guys in stripes and everything, and God, they looked like walking skeletons. So we stopped at the barbed wire and all. And a uh, question there, a lot of them were British uh, PWs. Mm -hmm. And then they said, well, they had others there too. There was a concentration camp, a place called Dachau. Mm -hmm. And a uh, well, PW camp. So it wasn't until about a week later in Munich that uh, word got back. So they had more than that. They, they they had Jews back there, and they were killing them by the thousands. Well, here, here we were right there at the camp, but we didn't even know about that. You had no intelligence on that? No, no. It just it was a uh, uh, PW camp and also political prisoners and all. That's that's all we, we had heard about. So. Now, being from Austria, was, was that a problem at all? No, except that I wanted to, after VE Day, I wanted to get to Austria, but uh, they said no way the Russians wouldn't let anything like that happen. Mm -hmm. So, no, no, not at all. No. No. Okay. And, um, Although for my dad, I guess he was investigated because he worked for Curtis Wright. Okay. And he was a... Uh, pretty good machinist, and he knew mathematics uh, like a whiz. Uh, he could go to those log tables and do anything, and a lot of the young engineers would ask him how to do stuff. But uh, I remember saying he was investigated at uh, whoever it was, FBI or whatever, the background and everything to make sure, because he was a very sensitive area of the experimental shop at the Curtis Wright uh, Aeronautics there in Buffalo. Mm -hmm. But other than that, uh, no. I didn't speak with an accent either. <laughs> oh, you did? No, well, I didn't know any English, but I picked it up from the kids in that school, so. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you you visited Dachau briefly? Well, uh, I, we went back uh, uh, after a 50th anniversary thing mm -hmm. uh, back a couple of years ago, and they still had two of the barracks there, and uh, oh, there must have been 50 or 60 these huge barracks 
Uh, way in the back corner, they had the ovens where they, where they, uh, where they killed the Jews. Mm -hmm. And there's a big memorial there by the Jewish people uh, uh, as a memorial to the people there. Mm -hmm. But I could recognize the low slung buildings and all that. Yeah. A lot of emotions. I imagine. The, um, so the war is beginning to wind down? Yeah, yeah. Because by the time we got to Munich, uh, uh, even before that, the uh, Germans were given up in droves. And uh, a thousand, you know, marching down the road with maybe just a couple of MPs and putting them out in the fields with all because, hey, they wanted to give up to us, mm -hmm. not to the Russians. No way. <laughs> you know, they felt, well, they had more in common with Americans. And the prisoners we did take, uh, they, oh, I don't know, you shouldn't be fighting us anymore. Why don't you join us and we could fight Russia? Because you're going to be fighting Russia eventually. Well, that, <laughs> that came pretty darn close. Mm -hmm. So, What was, uh, as the war winds down, what was the main use for the intelligence unit? Uh, not too much other than to help the... Uh, uh, the government guys that came in as we went through uh, uh, the, the government uh, administrators would uh, try to set up shop mm -hmm. at all the different towns and villages and counties to get, to get some government back into order again. So we helped out there occasionally. But as soon as we got to uh, a little place called Dorfen, it's just about 30, 40 miles uh, east of Munich, and they announced about the VE Day, and uh, no celebration. Everybody just sat down and quiet, you know, just just a letdown. Yeah. Just no hurrahs or anything. It was just a collapse. Hmm. Yeah. So they uh, then they said, "Well, they want to pull us back to." Uh, oh no! Before that, they we we had to be there for oh, another three or four weeks. Uh, they said, well, they're going to give passes to, to the guys. Uh, you draw lots, you either get a week at the Riviera or a three-day pass to Paris. Well, the lot I picked, guess what, back to Paris. <laughs> so, okay, we got back, and oh, sure, changed, and things were humming again, and the, you know, the bistros were going, and the wine merchants were out there. So on the way back, uh, by train, uh, we are on the outskirts and uh, we pulled off to a siding and we were there for oh seven eight hours meanwhile I had nothing to eat so all we had was a, a bottle of cognac I had a bottle of cognac and uh, the other guys had cigarettes and they said well you got cigarettes and cognac I didn't smoke at that time yet they said well you got to try a cigarette that'll that'll help your your stomach and won't feel hungry yeah so okay I tried a cough and a heck and away and we were there for another three or four hours beyond that, so about 12 hours. Hungry, and so we had, <laughs> we had a little booze and <laughs> cigarettes. And that's how I started my cigarettes when I was at advanced age. <laughs> so, uh, 20, 24. So we got back and uh, the uh, Lieutenant Colonel, uh, who was the West Pointer, okay, where were you guys? Well, we got hung up in the uh, yards and everything. And, for an extra two days, and I well, it wasn't quite that long, and, I, and he, he chewed us out, but then he sort of relented and said, okay, well, the, the war is over. <laughs> he, 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 he doesn't carry much weight anymore. <laughs> so uh, we uh, <clears throat> finally got back to, to our headquarters in Paris, and they weren't sure what to do with us to maybe send us uh, to, to the Pacific. So we were in a little place called the Vizine, which is a suburb. And we were supposed to be out there, but we thought, nah. So uh, we got a uh, place in town again. And so we commuted out on the first train in the morning to stand roll call. Mm -hmm. And it was June, and it was warm. And there was a swimming pool nearby, so we went over and, oh, what a sight. These girls with, with small bathing suits, a little here and a little here. And that's what today is called a bikini. So if they say, well, the haute couture of, the, of Paris designed that. That's a bunch of bull. Yeah, these kids were wearing it then. So we asked some of the people there, because the guy I was with spoke French fluently, you know, how come? He said, there's no material. 
So they, they made do with what they had. They had these little skimpy things here and here, uh, ergo the, the bikini. So it wasn't some French designer that did that. <laughs> so, so another fellow and I, I said, well, what can we do here? <clears throat> I had something on the bullet board that said, hey, they need somebody to instruct accounting. Where? In England. Hey, why not? So we took a plane out of Orley Field and up to London and uh, just uh, outside a uh, town of Shrivenham. There was an American University set up, so we taught accounting for a while to, until we got home. We had plenty of points because of being in mm -hmm. five battles and the longevity and all, but <laughs> no room on the ships. <laughs> So we spent another oh few months there, and then we shipped down to a place called Tidworth, where we were in British barracks that were great during the Boer War, and it was getting cold, and uh, the uh, uh, area where the bunks were about twice as long as this, and a fireplace half the size of that one down there, and that's supposed to be heat, you know, and no no hot water, and we complained to the British. Well, you guys are soldiers. You don't need hot water. <laughs> Come on. So then we finally shipped out, and uh, uh, now we got into New York Harbor, and the, the the whole whole ship tilted to the left to to see the mm -hmm. Statue of Liberty. Must have been quite a sight at that oh, point. Oh yeah, yeah I got to, uh, yeah. Where uh, were you uh, discharged? Uh, out of Fort Dix. Okay. They set us back there. And I thought, well, from there I get back home. And I thought, well, I'll just spend another day or so in New York to say goodbye to New York. Uh, and uh, used to take the train quite often when I was down at CCNY, mm -hmm. the New York Central, the, up to Buffalo. Oh, the trains were crowded in those days. It's a shame to see the, uh, the trains going downhill and all. All the funds are going into the super highways. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and um, what'd you do when you got home? Well, uh, it took a, about a month. Uh, I said, no, I've got the GI Bill. I'm going to go back and finish school. I went back to the University of Buffalo and went full time, including summers. And uh, in two and a half years, I got my degree. So, yeah, business administration. Uh, because I told the other guys what I was going to do. You go back to school? You're crazy? I said, Hey, that's an opportunity, Mike. I said, because the parents couldn't afford to send me, mm -hmm. so it was a great, great thing. And after that? And after that, I uh, I got a job with the old Burroughs Adding Machine Company mm -hmm. in uh, in Buffalo. And after about a half a year or so, they needed new. Uh, I got married since I had a job. I got married in '48. October, and uh, they said, well, they needed some men in Detroit, the home office, to teach the new guys. So, okay, they got all just about all expenses paid. I thought, oh boy, what a deal! And we stayed in an apartment hotel, and we ate steak. Wow, oh, what a deal that was! So, we were there for a half a year, and they said, well, okay, back to Buffalo. And they said well, they needed somebody in Rochester, so they transferred me up, up to Rochester. And after a couple of years here, I said, do I want to do that the rest of my life, you know, working on commission and all. And, and one of my customers was called the Haloid Company, and I sold a machine to them, a bookkeeping machine, adding machines. And they were, oh, $150 or something for even an adding machine. And uh, they couldn't pay the bill. So my company said, well, we're going to dock you for $150 if you don't come up with the money. So I went to... Well, I went to the, I guess, the office manager at that time, Kent Damon. I guess he just died recently, who eventually was the treasurer. And I told my story. I said, gee, I'll lose a, a couple of weeks, two and a half weeks' pay just because you're not paying my bill. Oh, well, you see, well, I finally got it. And, of course, that became a Xerox company. And when people said, well, aren't you going to invest in Xerox? I boy, was I smart. No way. <laughs> uh, so... Uh, and then I heard of an opening up at uh, Kodak and uh, had a deal with uh, administering uh, the needs of office machines and office equipment and furniture for uh, State Street. Mm -hmm. And that had about oh, 1,800 people, all the machines and all. Well, I learned about furniture pretty easily. So, 
and the budget I had was just phenomenal at that time. That was 1955. Uh, something like a hundred thousand a year for the furniture and about two hundred thousand for office machines. Well, in those days, that was mm -hmm. a load. So, uh, but I had to be careful of the uh, the salesman coming in, especially one of the local ones was well known. I won't use his name. That you know, lunches and this and the dinner. No, no, no dinner. Occasional lunch, okay. But because I was a little older and been around the horn <laughs> to know uh, no better. So. And they uh, said, well, gee, they needed somebody down in New York, uh, so transfer me down to the old Record Act Corporation that was the uh, subsidiary of the microfilm business. Mm -hmm. And that was at 9th Street and Broadway, so here I am back to New York again. So I lived in the village, practically, and then I commuted to uh, New Jersey. And I lived fairly close, only took me an hour and a quarter to get to work, <laughs> compared to the two hours that some of them had. Mm -hmm. So I spent five years down there, and, and with the kids growing up, a, a son and a daughter, they, uh, they are ready to change from the elementary to junior high and junior high to senior high. So, so we took them to all the plays and places, and, like How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying. We saw that down there, Man from La Mancha, et cetera, et cetera. So we packed everything in as we could and moved back here in 66. So. Mm -hmm. Back here ever since? Back, back to Kodak up here. And I live in Pittsburgh now. Yeah. They have since 66. How would you um, summarize your military experience? Uh, I think at the time it, it was uh, somewhat of an adventure as opposed to a dark side at all. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, a certain optimistic view I think that, that a lot of us had. that. Uh, we're immortal. Yeah. Now that hey, what can happen to us? I think the only time I felt bad was that gee, if I fall here, if I get shot here, nobody's going to know where I am. That was my only concern. Mm -hmm. Where are the folks going to know where I am? Mm -hmm. Where's my sister know where I am? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm but, sure your parents were happy to see you come home. Oh yeah, oh well, yeah. They, uh, I know Dad met me at the station, and oh boy. Uh, and mother was home cooking a Wiener Schnitzel, one of my favorites, a bread of veal cutlet. Uh, no, that was a great homecoming. Well, we thank you very much. Well, you're more than welcome. You did.